In terms of um, the, some of the biggest challenges that you that you see, there are healthcare is regulated by various different bodies within the UAE, and um, amongst the seven Emirates. And what you find is that there's a lack of standardization in regulations and also in instructions, but mostly in the evolution also in how um, how their, their goals are being met and, and they evolve differently based on the, on the emirate that, you, that, that you're in. And this uh, depends on the resources that they have. Some of the pressing issues facing healthcare are the following. Um, retaining medical personnel and, cu and cutting costs are pressing needs today. Decreased migration of local emirates abroad, abroad for care um, is a goal. Information um, technology is experiencing huge growth. And the UAE government has announced elect the EMR utilization for all providers. Um, training for emirates in the field of medicine, nursing, and pharmacy is needed. And education is a major focus for investment. Three new medical schools, five nursing programs, and a, phar and a pharmacy training program are in the pipeline for construction but research infrastructure is very expensive. And to attract the most promising research projects would take years. The Dubai Health Authority has reported a shortage of about 8,000 beds by 2025. So shortage of bed is also another um, pressing issue. Now let's look at the American influence on healthcare. We know that cost is an issue and we discussed the, the pressing issues. But America has influenced Dubai in a few ways, uh, mostly in four modalities. And, and the American accredited, accreditation system, standardizing recommendation care parameters um, by adopting metrics that define and reward care based on value. Cost containment utilize, utilizing a, a DRG classification system and to form strategic business partnerships with American institutions. Let's look at, get, take a, a closer look at each of these modalities. Hospital accreditation is done at the hospital level by accreditation bodies such as the JCO, that's the Joint Commission of Accreditation of Healthcare Organizations. It is necessary for payments for federally funded Medicare and Medicaid programs in the USA. The Joint Commission accredits about 78% of USA hospitals. These measures drive one of the best system in the world in regard to education and services provided. Accreditation has become a standard and most patients desire care by accredited institutions. The UAE, UAE has adopted the American and some European accreditation system. In the United States, the CMS uses metric value-based programs, which provides incentives for quality care defined by certain metrics. In this slide, I show the hospital-based um, purchasing program. And if a, if a hospital achieves these measures, they are rewarded financially. In the UAA, these metrics provide a guidelines for quantifying and defining care, which is excellent. Strategic business partnership has been formed um, by, by forming um, some of these in, um, institutions are world renowned, like the Cleveland Clinic operates a world-class specialty hospital clinic in Abu Dhabi. And um, one thing that's worth noting is that the relationship between the Children's National Medical Center and the Health Authority of, Dubai, of Abu Dhabi has placed as there, that partnership has resulted, as, resulted in the UAE being a destination for regional pediatric care. The DRG is a way, is a, basically a patient system that standardizes prospective payments to hospital. It is utilized as a cost containment measure. The goal of the DRG is to streamline payment protocols and to provide greater payment transparency and accountability. The DRG approach was brought to the sector in, in February of 2020, and it provides a more structured method of billing and a more unified way of billing. 
So one of the benefits that um, we America has given a lot of influence on the UAE. However, there's one way the UAE might in the future perhaps influence the United States. They have, been, they have achieved universal care for all. What lessons will the USA learn from the UAE is, is too early to be determined. The United States currently have private corporations who pay for care, Medicare and Medicaid, and which is provided by the government and a large uninsured population. The Affordable Care Act aimed to make this process better by mandating care for all, but that was failed, fell short in the court system. In the UAE, health, care, health insurance must be obtained before a visa is issued. It is a requirement for work in, entry. And they, what they have been successful in doing is putting the cost of this care on, pri on, the, on the private sector. But remember, it, um, the UAE is unique in that 80, it has 89% expats. The local Emirates provides, um, care is provided to the local Emirates by the government. So in that, the system of the UAE, no one goes uninsured. And this is attributed to less political involvement and, large, and a large expatriate community. Paying for care is not as political as in the United States, where it's influenced by lobbying interests. The lobbying interests in the United States are influential given an industry where revenues are in the billions of dollars. And I use this as an example. United Healthcare, for example, had $257.1 billion in revenues in 2020. Now let that sit, sit for a second. $257.1 billion in revenues in 2020 and a net income of $15.77 billion. In the UAE, the quality of the insurance is not the same as in the US. The USA Affordability Office concluded that if the US could get the administrative cost of the medical system down to the Canadian level where care is universal, savings would be enough to pay for health insurance for all uninsured Americans. The impact of the American system has improved standards in the UAE. Having multiple regulatory bodies impedes standardization, but they are moving in the right direction. Cost is addressed by placing the burden to pay um, on, the private, on the private sector. It is too early to see the impact of the cost of care. The actions, however, raises a few questions for the future. Some of these are, how will insurance payers influence care? Um, what role will competition play? Will that insurance revenues reach the astronomical value seen in the US with some, with, with, with some of these insurance companies? And what role will value-based care play with future reimbursements? And what lessons will the US learn from this approach to, um, from, um, from the, the UAE's approach? So the UAE and the US um, have a shared future, which clearly benefits the UA in, 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 in regard to quality and standard. However, the impact of cost may provide lessons and useful data for the US in the future that's providing a mutual benefit. And if you have any questions, um, that was the end and thank you. Thank you very much, Wayne, for this very interesting and, and for a very important sector and definitely during the pandemic, a key sector. So any questions for him? The UAE was quite uh, advanced in vaccination. I think they started vaccinating very, very early. Is that right? Yeah, they, one of the things I liked about the, them is that they're very efficient in how they go about um, when they want to, Dubai is on the path of being one of the happiest city in the world. And recently I traveled there in November. When I went, it, it was safer there than it was in the USA, in Florida, where I was. And I was really concerned about going there at the time. But after looking at the statistics and data to enter the country, I needed to have a negative test. And they were one of the first people to actually implement that when they reopened. The irony was that to come back to the US, I followed the guidelines to get a negative test. It took me almost, um, it took me out of my way to get it. 
But when I came back, they told me that the officer did not even look at the test. Um, but the but the rate of the of infection there is very low. Yeah, very interesting. A any other questions? So do you work with the UAE yourself? No, no, no. I was visiting friends there um, at the okay. time. Yeah. Okay. I just have an interest in in in, in the Middle East because uh, I think it's a fascinating part of the world. But when I visited, I did not expect to like it to the degree I did. It's actually reminding me of Miami where I live. And then I found that very surprising. Yeah, it's like, a, sometimes they say like a, like Disneyland of, a, of yeah. Abu Dhabi and Dubai. Yes. And okay. Abu Dhabi currently is closed. There's no, they're still closed down from the um, pandemic. Roads, oh, highway, know. very strict okay. in Abu Dhabi. Okay, thank you very much. Very interesting. Hopefully, the uh, so there are both sides need to learn because definitely the amount of expenses in uh, healthcare in the U.S. is seventeen percent of the GDP, which is by any account too much and uh, needs to be uh, reduced. Thank you very much. You're welcome. And one more question. Okay, so we have a completely different topic, which is very interesting. Oliver Herold, who comes from fashion uh, industry and is also uh, teaching in, in one of the schools. Uh, I don't know the name of the school, sorry, Oliver. Do you yeah, let us the, know? Yeah, <laughs> yeah the, the, the Fashion Institute of Technology. Thank you, Lourdes. Yeah, so very interesting. So then, uh, uh, yeah, the fashion school, Sophia says, Sorry, I'm a little bit far from this world and don't I don't worry. know that well, but yes, definitely the fashion school. So thank you, Sophia, for reminding me. And he's talking about Vietnam and textiles and apparel. Very interesting. Vietnam has become, and as he will let us know, uh, quite a prominent country for exports of uh, textiles and, and apparel. So very interesting. So please, Oliver, go ahead. And also beautiful pictures in your presentation. You can see that you are in fashion. Uh, industry. Uh, I, I really enjoyed your PowerPoint. So please oh, go ahead. Thank you, Lourdes. Thank you. Um, let me share my screen with, um, with everyone this evening. Um, and uh, let me, okay. Um, let's see here. Okay. Um, can everyone see this? Okay. All right, um, so hello everyone. Um, again, I want to take this time to thank Lourdes, Daniel, and everyone at Cornell University's Emerging Market Institute for allowing me to present Vietnam, a smart future for textiles and apparel. Maybe you can say a few words about yourself because probably, uh, for instance, Wayne doesn't know you very well, so. Okay, so I'm a fashion designer and I'm currently a professor at uh, Fashion Institute of Technology and um, uh, I, I, I taught in China um, several years and um, I was in Vietnam. Um, a great curiosity of mine is the silk industry. And when I was in Vietnam, right before the lockdown in January, I had the chance to visit um, several factories and also um, take a look at their um, you know, uh, their, their, their way of doing fashion. So um, I design, I drape, um, I, 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 yeah, so all of those good things. So, um, so again, I, I um, um, and it's a, it's, it's a real pleasure uh, being part of the Emerging Market Institute and being able to present this. Um, so this case explores areas of Vietnam's economy, society, uh, the pandemic response with a focus and overview of the Vietnamese textile and apparel industry, the Vietnamese sericulture industry, and some future opportunities and recommendations. Vietnam's official name is the Socialist Republic of Vietnam and is led by the Vietnamese Communist Party that elects its chief of state, its president every five years. From a landmass perspective, we can see that Vietnam would span the length from Milwaukee, Wisconsin, all the way down to Tallahassee, Florida. Its current population is roughly 100 million people and its healthy growth rate at 0.9% annually positions itself to grow by another 7 million by the year 
2040. Vietnam's pandemic response has been successful so far. The first case was declared January 23rd, 2020. I left the country January 15th. Um, early concerted efforts helped ease lockdown restrictions in Vietnam. They created a national hotline and dedicated website to tackle the pandemic. At this time, there have been 2,475 confirmed cases and only 35 fatalities officially reported. Also at this time, borders remain closed for international travelers. Vietnam as an emerging market continues to grow by its rejuvenation efforts that began in 1985. The Doi Moi reforms have transformed the country from one of the poorest in the world to a middle income nation through market reforms that include cooperatives and privatization. Heavy investment in education has also benefit, benefited Vietnam and its literacy rate is at 95%. Vietnam borders China, Cambodia, and Laos. Its local and global partners include the Association of Southeast Nations, ASEAN, the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation, APAC, and the World Trade Organization, the WTO. Recent global partners and agreements include the Vietnam-Korea Free Trade Agreement, the Comprehensive and Progressive Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, the Vietnam-EU free trade agreement and post Brexit UK free trade agreement. Last year marked the 25th anniversary of the United States and Vietnam reestablishing diplomatic relations. Vietnam has benefited from shifting manufacturing supply chains from neighboring emerging markets. Vietnam has surpassed several major trading partners from Europe and Asia in recent years, exporting goods to the United States. During the pandemic, the textile and apparel industry has been characterized by a power imbalance between brands and buyers on one end and the textile and garment producers on the other. 20% of the Vietnamese workforce are employed in the textile and apparel industry. Important associations have played a critical role in supporting the industry recently hit hard by the pandemic. Those include Vitas, the Vietnam Textile and Apparel Association, AgTech, the Association of Garments, Textiles, Embroidery and Knitting, and also a global player, the Sustainable Apparel Coalition, a multi-stakeholder and nonprofit organization committed to offering standards and value chain sustainability in the global fashion supply chain. These organizations have been vital in assisting families who have lost employment and salaries. They have also played an important role in mediating contract disputes and canceled orders that include raw materials or finished goods due to the COVID-19 pandemic. The largest employer with 80,000 employees is Vinatex, the Vietnam National Textile and Garment Group. They make and manufacture garments and invest heavily in dyeing, finishing and weaving of textiles. Perhaps some of you in your wardrobe, you have garments that are made in Vietnam. If you take a look at the label sewn into the garment. Some brands we know include Nike, Patagonia, and Uniqlo, made in Vietnam, just to name a few. The image map on the left gives you an idea where most of the textile and apparel activities occur, with 64% of it in and around Ho Chi Minh, um, Ho Chi Minh City in the south. 75% of raw materials are currently imported from South Korea, Taiwan, and China. There's an opportunity to reduce dependence on foreign raw materials that include silk and cotton. Vietnam can gain market share in the development and continued commercial production of sericulture. Sericulture is everything silk. It's the production of silk and silkworms 60 countries participate in sericulture. Leaders in the space include China, India, Uzbekistan, Thailand, South Korea, and in sixth place, Vietnam, producing approximately 795 metric tons of silk last year. That's a lot of silk. 
have a little video here also when I was visiting um, the silk farm. So I'm gonna play this while, while we continue. Oh, what happened here? Let's see if this works. Yeah, okay. Um, so there are four types of silkworms that include the Muga, a rare silkworm found in India, the Anthuria, a silkworm not domesticated, the Samia worm that eats castor oil plant leaves, and the Bombyx mori worm seen here that accounts for 90% of the global silk production. Um, as I just showed, it's a video of mature silkworms eating leaves. Um, and this was in the province of Hoi An last January, right before the global lockdown. After feeding, they begin spinning its silk cocoon, which takes approximately three days to complete the spinning process. Silk is a natural protein fiber produced by the larvae of a moth. A single strand can run the length of about one mile. The Vietnamese sericulture industry went through challenges in the early 2000s as global silk commodity prices contracted. I'm going to um, do this. Sorry, folks. Significant steps have been made to scale mulberry tree acreage to ensure Vietnamese sericulture industry continues to grow. One hectare of mulberry trees can yield 11 tons of leaves producing around 450 pounds of cocoons that yield about 100 pounds of raw silk. Here we see a full basket of silkworm cocoons ready to be degummed. Degumming is described as the process of removing the saracen protein from the silk strand. It is quite labor intensive and modern equipment has been developed for degumming and reeling. As we just saw, this artisan was reeling together strands of silk to make silk thread for further processing in the raw supply chain. Large machinery has replaced the traditional hand push shuttle looms weaving fabrics, but there are still many areas in Vietnam with traditional looms. We see a technician setting up a traditional loom handling warp and weft silk threads to make traditional silk fabric. To put things into perspective, it takes about 3,000 cocoons to make one yard of silk. Although silk production makes up less than 0.2% of the global fiber market, it is still a significant multi-billion dollar industry every year. The US remains the largest importer of silk products globally. Vietnam is continuing to advance in sericulture and has recently partnered with an American company exploring silk with superior properties. This unique pr partnership explores exciting opportunities for the Vietnamese sericulture industry. Craig Biocraft Laboratories is leading the way in exploring genetically sequenced silkworms. The proprietary genetic engineering fuses spider gene sequencing into the silkworm, producing superior silk. This fusion holds tremendous promise in their patented spider silk. It is described as life-saving and ballistic resistant material, which is lighter, thinner, and tougher than steel. In 2016, Craig Biocraft Laboratories were awarded by the US Army to develop and produce protective apparel and equipment utilizing their patented silk materials. The Ann Arbor, Michigan company celebrated last month's Ann Arbor Day with planting more than 100,000 mulberry trees in Vietnam. They continue to partner with Vietnamese municipalities to minimize additional risks in water consumption, pollution, and the impact on workers and their communities developing their trademarked dragon silk, monster silk, and spider silk through the silkworm. Some final thoughts and recommendation. Vietnam will continue to positively move forward in a post-COVID world. The textile and apparel industry will remain competitive and garner increased market share in sericulture, technical fabrics, manufacturing, and opportunities in silk and cotton. Global fashion brands and retailers have recently been urged to find alternative cotton sources, sourcing 
destinations like Vietnam. The cotton supply chains are being shifted away from Vietnam's northern neighbor. Monetary policy should remain supportive and established fiscal policy should continue to support firms and vulnerable households impacted by the pandemic. The textile and garment sector remain one of the country's top export industries, significantly contributing to Vietnam's GDP. Numbers are still being released, but fiscal year 2020 project Vietnam's exports of textiles and apparel to be $42 billion up from 39 billion in 2019. The pandemic has exposed major risks to Vietnam's supply chain, underscoring the importance of upgrading its infrastructure. With 50% of the population expected to be living in urban areas, Hanoi and Ho Chi Minh City are building rapid transit systems that will aid in clean transportation choices while reducing air pollution throughout the country. Vietnam is resilient and continue, continues to demonstrate leadership as an emerging market. It was a pleasure presenting Vietnam, a smart future for textiles and apparel. And it was a real wonderful experience and journey these past two years being part of the Emerging Market Institute. Thank you all. And I'll be glad to answer any questions at this time. Thank you very much, uh, Oliver. Very interesting, also very different. And uh, yeah, looking at Vietnam in a, as a really fast growing economy. A similar success happened with coffee. This was a, they were drinking tea before. They mm -hmm. used a loan from the World Bank, started planting coffee, and now they have become the second biggest exporter of coffee in the world. Amazing. Yeah, and also the, the prices went down. That's another matter. That's uh, more, uh, any questions to Oliver? Very interesting country, a country that has survived so many years between China and many others in, in different invasions, very strong country, as you say. Yes. Well, one of the few who grew in 2020, 2.9, very interesting. And also with the pandemic, very nice. Okay, any, any questions about Vietnam or the apparel industry in Vietnam? Oliver, do you travel quite a <clears throat> bit to different countries to do this kind of research? Yes. Yeah. Great question, Michael. Yes. Um, uh, I've, uh, I've enjoyed um, learning about the textile and apparel industries um, quite deeply when I, when I travel over there. Um, I've been to Indonesia and Thailand and Vietnam. And um, again, uh, um, you know, there's, there's a great interest um, on a micro level. So yeah, thank you. Is there any um, production in the U.S. for these types of textiles? Um, yes, there is. Um, there, it's it's more of from an artis artisanal approach, um, you know. But uh, the previous administration, there were some tactics um, with tariffs and trying to get manufacturing back into the United States. Um, but again, the labor, um, the the um, the efficiencies overseas are, are very attractive for American manufacturers. And so um, usually um, fashion houses that I've consulted with, um, there's a percentage of, of manufacturing done here in the United States along with um, in Asia. So there's always that balance and, and, and the supply chain has been really strained um, through the pandemic and we've learned a lot from it. And I think that all countries will um, will benefit from, from what has been learned during the pandemic. Great, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Mako. Any other questions? Actually, we have this group of E20. We focus on the biggest emerging markets and Vietnam is going to quite likely join this year because has grown so much and as you were saying, has moved from a low income country to a middle income one and, and the growth has been spectacular in the last uh, 10 years so we, we we are waiting for the latest numbers from the world bank but we believe that this year uh, pakistan will go that was before a member of the e20 and vietnam will join nice. so thank you very good presentation excellent oliver okay so we are moving now to tyler Tyler uh, has worked now for almost a year on a super interesting subject that is uh, debt, uh, debt, um, yeah, the, the 
yeah, the difficult balance between debt in Africa and also the need for African countries to invest in health and education. How do you manage that? Servicing the debt that usually occupies all the resources you have and continuing to invest for the long-term uh, viability and long-term growth of the country and means investing basic services like health and education. A very, very interesting, actually Tyler also presented in my class uh, that current global issues for a group of Colombian students and it was uh, really interesting. So uh, Tyler, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you, Lourdes. Um, it's a pleasure. And uh, before I start, I just want to congratulate all of the uh, students and faculty that are have made it through another bizarre and challenging semester. And um, a special congrats to uh, our graduates. I'm also graduating, so I feel the vibe. <laughs> um, all right, so I became interested in this last summer uh, while I was a research intern for, for Lourdes actually at EMI over the summer. Um, I, 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 I didn't initially come into this with an interest in debt or even international finance. It kind of just naturally emerged from from the internship. Um, it was at the time it was it was um, late May, early June 2020. There was a lot of uncertainty about the pandemic. I mean, not that there still isn't uncertainty, but then it was especially uncertain. And a lot of the reports that were coming out from the World Bank and the o OECD were really painting a grim picture um, about the debt situation uh, in sub-Saharan Africa in particular. Um, I'm, I think I'm particularly interested in the debt restructuring process more so than like the, the actual business of debt. But um, I think it's really important because the COVID era has really, um, it's forcing experts and global leaders to fundamentally question and re-examine the cross-border lending playbook at every level. And I think it's a really important time and inflection point in the history of uh, cross-border finance. And so it's been a really interesting adventure and, um, this presentation could be an hour long. So I'm just gonna go for the eight minute, uh, very high level um, roll through this. Uh, let's see, okay. So I'm gonna briefly cover the history of debt, debt crises, debt restructuring in Sub-Saharan Africa. We're gonna look at the debt relief um, programs that have been successful in the past. Um, and then we're gonna really zero in on the current wave, uh, the current situation. If we have time, we'll, we'll talk about uh, the Chinese lending model, which is unique um, and very a very large um, presence on the continent. And then we'll talk about the implications of COVID-19 um, for the future of debt sustainability. Um, yeah, so. All right, the COVID-19 pandemic has exacted a heavy toll on both the people and the economy in many African countries. According to a 2021 report by the African Development Bank, the economic fallout from the pandemic has pushed around 30 million Africans into extreme poverty and is expected to undo a decade or more of developmental progress. The, the World Bank estimates that in 2020, the reach per capita incomes declined by 6.1% and the economic output on the entire continent had, had contracted by 3.7%. Um, as we move into a um, kind of like a historical, very fast historical overview of debt, um, on the continent. Starting in the 1960s, many post-independence African leaders optimistic that externally financed infrastructure-led in, um, investment strategies could spur economic growth. Uh, at the time, the Western economic view uh, supported this developmental approach under the tenets of the Washington Consensus. And, and really, it was there, there was this general understanding that the world's developing nations could accelerate their economies by, by building infrastructure. Um, Borrowing in, in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, where I, I tend to focus a lot of my analysis, surged uh, dramatically in the late 1970s due to um, a combination of like uh, optimism regarding future trends and export earnings, um, low real interest rates at the time, and excess liquidity in the international capital markets in the form of syndicated loans. A lot of this was recycled petrodollars at the time. Um, with the debt to GDP ratios rising like really fast, uh, just a, a really pronounced surge at the time, um, there was, it, it unfortunately coincided with somewhat of a global economic slowdown um, and declining commodity prices, which is really uh, similar to, to what we're seeing now or more what we were seeing um, last fall. But either way, um, in around 1982, almost uh, half of African countries were in arrears on debt 
payments, um, which led to two decades of negative per capita income growth in, in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, the main factors that were kind of driving this buildup um, and then initially, and then what kind of catalyzed the, the fallout was um, these exogenous shocks in terms of trade, uh, lack of um, like timely implemented macroeconomic responses to, to the, the debt crisis before it got out of control, um, the non-concessional nature and unfavorable refinancing policies of the creditors at the time that changed. Um, the ineffective debt management strategies, and then obviously um, political factors, including corruption and, and civil war and, and other things um, in line with that. Uh, in response, the, MI, the IMF came in with what's been known as structural adjustment programs. Um, these were originally envisaged as like a short-term strategy to stabilize the heavily indebted economies. Like it was really just an emergency response. It was thrown together very hastily and implemented very strongly. Um, they've been considered by, by many experts to be some of the most extreme and intrusive forms of external intervention um, and, and uh, external economic intervention. And, and they were really unduly harsh in terms of reducing social services expenditures. Like that would, that's really what gets cut first. And that's really kind of um, where a lot of critics and, and analysts are looking now at the current debt situation is like, okay, well, with a public health crisis, right? Like, are we going to start cutting... Um, you know, social service expenditures at a time when, when you know, the, the pandemic is really accelerating in the global south. Um, oftentimes these, these SAPs, the structural adjustment programs were beyond the administrative abilities of the governments involved. And so you really did have like the World Bank and the IMF kind of policing this in real time in these countries. And this is just, um, this just really created a bad uh, dynamic between these large multilateral institutions and these developing economies. And, and really that, that tension still exists to this day. And it's, a, it's part of the reason why Chinese lending has been so successful in the region is because Chinese loans really don't come with all this conditionality. There's a lot less rules and also a lot less transparency as it happens. And, and we'll get into that a little bit further along here. Um, the principal aims of the, of the structural adjustment programs were to restore external trade equilibrium through it, it basically like manipulating exchange rates and currencies. Uh, they were to eliminate distortions in domestic pricing structures. And, and most importantly, and what has come under the most scrutiny is reduce government finances through cutting public expenditures, liberalizing trade and privatizing industry. Um, these paradoxically, it became clear um, it became clear that these programs, although they helped in sh with short-term liquidity issues, they ultimately resulted in further increases of debt stocks uh, with the average debt of Sub-Saharan African economies in 1994 exceeding 100% of GDP. That's the average uh, debt um, of these countries at the time. The failure of this approach uh, to provide lasting debt resolution to these countries was highlighted by the fact that on average, uh, SSA or Sub-Saharan African countries rescheduled their debt agreements four times between 1980 and 1996. That was the average amount of reschedulings in this area. So it just was really creating more problems than it was solving. Um, and then it also was often the case at the time that new loans were being taken from official creditors and they were being used to pay interest on old loans to private creditors. And this is this, this notion of burden sharing is really is, well, we'll get to it in a few minutes, but it's part of what's causing um, so many problems right now. Um, so in light of this, the fact that these SAP programs weren't really working, like it was time to get very creative and very aggressive and, and how we're going to do this. And um, it, this, this model, uh, was really kind of taken from the Latin American debt crisis that preceded this. Um, and the conversation, you know, shifted from debt restructuring to like, okay, well, it's time for debt forgiveness. It's time to start canceling loans. And this is when the HIPC came in, which is the Heavily Indebted Poor Countries Initiative. Uh, this, this initiative's objective was to use debt relief to bring the debt burdens down to sustainable levels. Under the HIPC initiative, countries who successfully um, adhered to a specific set of structural reforms, similar to, to the structural adjustment, but a lot less uh, intrusive. Um, if they adhered to this specific set of structural reforms and economic policies for six years, I mean, that's a long time, but for six years, this would they would receive debt relief from the multilateral institutions, official creditors and commercial creditors. They, these creditors are kind of all falling under the umbrella of the Paris Club um, lenders. 
Yeah, this was a significant development because previous to this initiative, debt issued by multilateral creditors was non-rescheduled. So this was a huge transition. Um, and let's see. And then following that, the multilateral debt relief initiative. Um, this program kind of was the same thing, but taken up a notch and it enacted debt relief proposals, um, which pushed for the total cancellation of all debt. It wasn't a reduction. It wasn't a partial cancellation. It was a total cancellation. And this was, as you'll see in this graph, massively successful. You see here at the late 1990s, early 2000s, the, the percent of um, the debt to GDP ratio and percentage was just dropped. So this was incredibly successful, but it was also very aggressive and it really, um, it, 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 it kind of shocked lenders and it kind of definitely slowed a lot of cross-border lending in the early 2000s. Well, that takes us to the current wave. <laughs> Things got a little out of control after the recession. Um, the current global wave of debt is the largest and fastest increase in borrowing within emerging markets and developing economies seen in the past 50 years. And that's in real terms. The origin of the current debt situation in Sub-Saharan Africa in particular can be traced back to the, to the end of the recession. This is 2009, 2010. In the aftermath of the great financial crisis, the global financial crisis, interest rates in most advanced economies sank to record lows as excess liquidity from stimulus and monetary policies used to counter the recession saturated domestic financial markets. Sounds a little bit familiar, I would say. I think we're kind of uh, in a similar moment right now. Um, and, and this could have a similar trend. Anyway, funds managers at the time in the relentless search for higher short-term yields turned their attention overseas towards riskier resource-rich developing economies. Think 2010, 2011, this is when this is going down. One of the novel characteristics of the current wave of debt is its shift in composition from being largely issued by international financial institutions like the World Bank and Paris, Paris lenders to now being mostly comprised of private debt in the form of bonds, non-financial corporate debt, and other debt instruments um, in line with that. Another defining factor of the current debt situation in Sub-Saharan Africa is the exceptional rise of Chinese lending in the region driven by China's resources for infrastructure model, which I feel like I'm talking about almost every other day now in Lourdes' classes and, and stuff. It's, it's, a, it's a lending model that we'll, if we have time, we'll get to here in a little bit. But chi the, um, China is officially the largest bilateral lender on the African continent. And this has happened all in the same time post-recession when this private creditor base really emerged. And as you can see in this graph here, um, I, I would pay a lot of attention here to this purple portion here. This is bondholders. And as you can see, it was really, 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 really small until, until 2010. Now it comes up and it's making the majority of the debt, the creditor base. This is a real problem, um, not just the bondholders, but just like the complexity of a lot of these instruments that are being used um, in Sub-Saharan Africa. The problem here is that it's really hard to coordinate um, debt relief. And it's especially hard to do anything like the HIPC or the MDRI where you're canceling debt because these are bonds. And, and I know everybody here understands at least how a, a bond sort of works. And so it's really hard to contact hundreds of thousands of independent investors and try and get um, some sort of a coordinated debt relief um, synchronized effort going. And so this is the major reason why nothing is really happening um, with the current with the current situation. Um, COVID-19 really shocked this, the, the lending um, environment in Africa because of the plummet in commodities prices. Initially, this drove a lot of um, countries into debt distress and it's kind of um, continuing to get worse. And um, we'll talk about that a little bit here in, in a second. Um, the rise of Chinese lending, yeah. So uh, resources for infrastructure is pretty interesting and it's also um, have, has been much more successful. It has a higher correlation with per capita GDP growth than any other lending base in, in Africa. And basically the way that this works and the Belt Road Initiative you know, is infused with this lending practice. I mean, this is really at the core of a lot of the projects. It's basically like this. Um, the, the Chinese government talks to, um, um, for, for instance, the Angolan government and they work out a deal. And then Chinese banks in China are making the financial transaction with Chinese construction companies that come over to Africa, build something like a dam, a power grid, a road. And then in the case, what I think even more interesting, if they build a project that has to do with natural resource extraction, oftentimes Chinese companies will also manage that. So you have like this recycling 
of funds that's going through different Chinese entities. But what you get out of it is infrastructure um, with very few can terms attached to it. And so the idea is that by doing this, you're avoiding the Dutch curse or the resource or the Dutch disease or the resource curse. And so it's actually been pretty successful um, at, at, at what it's set out to do in, in that regard. Um, Despite rumors of China deploying debt trap diplomacy in Africa, there's a growing body of evidence uh, to suggest that China is highly unlikely to participate in asset seizures in the event of sovereign default. And this was something that was really, really, it was all the buzz when I was uh, doing my internship last summer with Lourdes. This is what we were all just completely, we were just really trying to pay attention to this and listen to what all the experts are saying. It was really fun. Um, so, in light of the COVID um, crisis and the, the global economic fallout, that's the worst since World War II, yada, yada, you guys have heard it all. It's a, it's a huge situation. Well, um, it's, it's caused major problems in resource-rich resource rich and tourism-based economies in Africa. And 35 countries are um, covered by what's known as the G20 DSSI. This is the Debt Service Suspension Initiative. This was initiated when I was in my internship last summer, actually, and I was following it really closely. And um, the debt service suspension initiative uh, is is a it's it's it is what it is. It suspends debt. It suspends the payments. It pauses everything until we figure out what to do, basically. And if it were not for this, even though not much has come out of it as far as debt restructuring, but if it were not for this DSSI right now, there would be huge issues in, in Sub-Saharan Africa in particular. Um, 35 of the countries covered by the G20 Debt Service Suspension Initiative are currently spending more on servicing their sovereign debt than on public health. So I'll say that again, they're currently spending more on servicing their sovereign debt than on public health. And this is at a time when child poverty and malnutrition in the, re in the region is rising and education budgets are being cut under fiscal pressures related to the global pandemic. The, uh, the lack of transparency and the complex creditor base of this new wave of debt is making burden sharing um, during these sovereign debt restructurings much more complicated and poses as a serious headwind for effective and timely policy responses in the face of a looming debt crisis. To complicate matters worse, as of March 2021, there has been zero participation or negotiation from private creditors in the DSSI relief initiative. This lack of participation poses a serious threat to the prospect of a cohesive and coordinated debt restructuring by all creditors involved. It's, it's causing a stalemate. Like China doesn't want to forgive a bunch of their loans if the money that they're forgiving is going to go and pay a bunch of bondholders and vice versa. Like the burden sharing problem is really hard when it's this complex of a creditor base. And so the situation is really just kind of getting um, more and more dire. Like you need it's 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 really it's a real it's a true real situation um <laughs> and uh thus far the virus has spread across the region has not been as rapid as initially predicted however this trend's continuation is highly uncertain as many areas worldwide like for instance brazil india um, have experienced severe second waves and new variants of the pandemic um, current projections anticipate that the widespread distribution of vaccines across the african continent will be impeded by a range of challenging hurdles such as high production costs, weak health systems, poor cold chain infrastructure, and insufficient logistical support across the board. 35 countries covered by the G20's uh, DSSI are currently um, in on the brink of, of default. And if it wasn't for the DSSI, they would be there now. And so I just think that this is a really serious situation that has um, interconnected implications in advanced economies as well. A lot of the debt that has been um, issued in Sub-Saharan Africa is held by, by European and US um, investment banks and, and different uh, pension funds and different things. So this, this is a very interconnected problem. And um, last time I gave this presentation to, to our class um, a, a couple of weeks ago, we kind of left it on this conversation of like really looking at what's going on in India and, and kind of relating that back to the DSSI. The DSSI, in order for this to even work in the end, we need to have a synchronized global economic rebound. And it's really hard to foresee that when you have an incredible um, surge in cases in India, which threatens to spread throughout the global South. And so, um, I think that it that it's my outlook is is 
cautiously optimistic, not to be cliche, but I definitely see some hurdles ahead of us. And um, I think that this story that I'm researching here is really just beginning. And um, yeah, that's my, that's my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. I hope I, I didn't mean, go over. Yeah, <laughs> no, I, because, okay, two or three, I think couldn't join us. So then I am a little bit more lenient on time. Uh, anyway, very interesting, uh, Tyler, because you always bring a different, what is this beautiful uh, snow? So any questions? <laughs> very interesting, definitely extremely interesting, extremely important because I was in a, in a workshop with the World Bank and what they are saying is that, as you are saying, everything is interconnected. So as you said, plenty, what happens if there is a major, major, major debt defaults in certain countries and basically who is holding this debt? So the debt is being held by banks all over, hedge funds and et cetera. So then uh, private investors of all kinds. So then the possibility of a contagion starting in what seems to be a small debt default or not that small, but okay, a debt default can be can spread very quickly. So definitely very important. Uh, any questions? Any comments? Okay, uh, Daniel, David Roosevelt has put a number of resources and links in the chat that yes, are very important. So thank you very much, David. So thank you, thank you all, a great, great presentation. And let's go to the last one, Michael and team about electrical vehicles. This last one was a little bit more pessimistic at what we have in front of us. And I think now we'll see that Okay, electrical vehicles is the way to go and definitely the possibility to, again, growth and innovation in disruption in, uh, in the automotive industry and, and much brighter future. So please go ahead, Michael. Foibos, Christy, Christina, Sofia, Yuki, and David Wu. Hi, thank you. Um, yes, we're part of the Executive MBA program, New York Metro class of 2021. And um, we did our capstone report on um, you know, how China's policy impacts the electric vehicle industry. And as we already mentioned, just myself, Evos, Christina, Maiko, Yuki, Sophia, and David. So China has wanted to be a global leader in the auto industry since the late 1990s. And um, entry into the World Trade Organization in 2001 really opened markets and provided opportunity for them to do so. So this is also when the new energy vehicle um, became a focus for the country and strategies started to be developed to realize China's goals of gaining auto industry leadership. Today, we will share details on China's policies and how it shaped their auto industry, electric vehicle trends that we see, supply chain of batteries and semiconductors, an analysis of what we think is needed for China to maintain its current leadership position. Next slide. So as you can see, it has been a long road for China to gain the dominance in electric vehicles that it has today. Starting with the 863 project, which is responsible for much of the technology developments of the country and evolving into other policies and programs. In 2006, an advisory committee was established to increase collaboration across industry experts, universities, research institutions, and the government. And this collaboration advanced the technology development and also accelerated policies to support them. And 2009 was a pivotal year when new energy vehicles were really declared as a national strategy, setting production goals for the country. It's also the year when the 10 cities, 1,000 vehicles program, which set a goal of 1,000 new energy vehicles each year in 10 cities 
was rolled out. Next slide. So, you know, to get to where they are, China really relied a lot on their policies and, and the influence of the government. So through subsidies for new energy vehicle purchases, investments in research and development, and uh, policies that implement that were implemented by the Chinese government, China encouraged broad adoption and created barriers to ensure domestic automakers really had an opportunity to be competitive. Investing in charging stations was also critical in making new energy vehicle use possible across the country. Next slide. So what we're seeing as far as trends for electric vehicles right now, I mean, climate change clearly is um, definitely increasing the motivation for all countries to invest in electric vehicles. The countries and private industry are all focused on developing battery technology that makes it easier and faster to charge, as well as cheaper to make. Some examples are QuantumScape, which is developing a battery that will charge up to 80% in only 15 minutes. Um, and Pohang University is also working on a battery that eliminates the need for cobalt, which will extend the life of the battery as well as make it less expensive. And we also see um, the expansion of electrification into other modes of transportation. So think about planes and transport trucks, ships, and you know even the scooters that we all see in, in a lot of cities around the world. Now Yuki will go on into supply chain. Thanks, Christy. So as we've seen the EV market force in China, it's really been dependent on the supply chain of two critical components, the brain and heart of the EV, the semiconductor and the battery itself. So let's start with the battery. China has really dominated the end to end supply chain for battery manufacturing from raw materials of cobalt, magnesium, and lithium to refining these rare, rare metals and processing the finished battery cells. Not only in China is this happening, but it has really broadened its control globally from Australia, Chile, and the Congo. Now, this reach has really proved to be significant leverage over its competitors who now rely on China. Uh, Chinese battery supply chain. Similar to the batteries, uh, China has really inserted itself into the semiconductor supply chain as the critical assembler, gaining 95% of global assembly share. As the brain of the EVs, the semiconductors really support the vehicle power systems and auxiliary functions. The power system needs semiconductors to um, control its current uh, reducing energy loss and even allowing for faster battery charging. The hardware support from semiconductors also seen in sensors or onboard cameras really provide the input to new autonomous driving and 5G connectivity. This these functions with these semiconductors is really going to be the most critical aspects of future smart vehicles and electrical mobility where China has new plans to further invest into the supply chain. So let's really take a look to see where China needs to focus to remain as dominant leaders in the EV market. First, it really comes down to policy. Continue to drive the climate policy and incentives. We've seen Germany and other European manufacturers introduce more than 30 new models in the last year and a half um, to really position themselves to hit the 2021 CO2 emission standards. Uh, really provided the incentives for consumers to buy and really drive the, the, the market. China can't lose there. Uh, next, innovation and infrastructure, they come hand in hand. With new clean power tech like fuel cells and hydrogen power uh, comes the need for new infrastructure, improving fast charging or wireless charging, or even co converting regular gas pumps to hydrogen pumps. China needs to continue its infrastructure investments to stay ahead. With the investments made in, in the country, they will be able to attract more uh, new investors new competitors into the market and really contribute to the marketplace. Fourthly, uh, invest in bet on the next right clean power tech. Uh, right now, they've been in the lithium ion battery marketplace. Um, as technology changes, as they have this stronghold in the supply chain, 
the US and other countries are now looking into new technology, whether it's hydrogen or fuel cells. Um, China can't just sit back and say, hey, we have the cornerstone of lithium ion. As the technology changes, they've got to stay ahead of the, the patents, the inventions and the innovation. So they're not like in the last 10 years, losing out to the Japanese and the Koreans for uh, hybrid vehicles. When they invest into the new supply chain, they're going to be able to be part of that uh, the pipeline, reduce costs for China, and um, not be left out in the cold. Lastly, they've got to keep an eye out on market disruption from standard EVs, electrical vehicles, to smartly connected electromobility. This is not just a play for automobiles, but how does that connect into our day-to-day -day lives? Through 5G and connectivity, they're going to be able to provide a, uh, innovate new business models new value delivery for, for uh, clients and consumers for faster adoption. So with these rough points of focus, China's gonna be able to continue as market leaders, pave the way for new electro mobility. So with that, uh, we thank you for the opportunity to share our findings with you tonight. Uh, and we'd like to open up for any Q and A. Thank you. That's a picture from pre-pandemic times at home. That's a nice picture, thank you. <sighs> okay, any questions? You have added, which I didn't know actually, that uh, plenty of chips are also manufactured in China because I thought that China had a tremendous deficit and needed to import from US and from Taiwan. Sure. Is that right that they, are, they already are so powerful in uh, so interestingly, they have 95% of the assembly uh, process in the supply chain, not the actual manufacturing of the semiconductors. So as they import this, now the, the vertical integration, um, trying to capture the supply chain is really where the focus is on to have, um, you know, additional investments in, into the manufacturing side of, the, of that piece. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, any other questions? I was pre-pandemic in Zhejiang, Zhejiang University. It's like number three or number four in the country. It's in, um, what's the name? David, Gu, please help me with the name of the place of Zhejiang University it's in Huangzhou. I don't pronounce it well. Yeah. Uh, uh, Zhejiang? Yeah, Zhejiang is in where uh, Alibaba headquarters are. Alibaba ah, headquarters. Yeah is in Guangzhou, what that beautiful- uh, Hangzhou? Yeah, Hangzhou, yeah, Hangzhou. So then uh, I was surprised. There was super calm. All scooters, all the mopeds, all electrical. So you couldn't hear anything. It was even dangerous for me because I would cross and I couldn't hear anything. So yeah, as you are saying, the idea is to electrify the whole, all vehicles, including in that city is very advanced very advanced but definitely on campus it was so quiet zero noise everything electric even the buses that were circulating over there everything that was i think when was that before pandemic i don't know i lose the months before the pandemic anyway very interesting thank you very 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 much any questions to any or any comments very different uh, subjects, uh, but very uh, all of them uh, very innovative. Okay, Tyler is is yeah. There is innovation also in trying to solve the crisis, the debt crisis now as well in different ways. So very interesting, very broad uh, in the way you you and and of course I I hope you enjoy uh, writing about it because it's a little bit out of your comfort zone. Also, these are in many cases horizontal subjects that cross among many disciplines so i think very interesting we will uh, we will uh, for sure uh, have them published uh, i will contact you and see how we daniel dos Anjos, who is here from the emi team will and i will work and see how we publish them but definitely really very interesting and worth it publishing so that others also will put this recording